today. Let me let me share a few things. Got a few announcements I want to share with you, but I want to back the morning. Am I, my, I'm on. Okay, uh, back up to Friday morning. I was had the opportunity to speak at Fellowship of Christian Athletes at the high school. And, and I asked the coach, there were two coaches, one was the dance team coach whom I know, obviously through faith, and another was one of the assistant football coaches, really nice guy, just met him for the first time. But I asked the dance team coach a few weeks ago, I had seen her at a game, and she said, hey, are you ready to come speak? I said, I'll be glad to. Can I bring my Bible? She said, well, yeah, absolutely. So I, just a 10-minute talk, but I get to go in there with my Bible, open it up, read scripture from it, end with a prayer at the high school. Thought that was pretty cool. Friday night, they debut our new commercial, uh, church commercial. Maybe you've seen that online. It is very well done. And they debuted that, played it about three or four times during the game uh, Friday night. It's really good. So I was excited about that. And then at a cross country meet yesterday morning, they have this loud music playing. Uh, Ashlyn get, is getting ready to run and they play this loud music and I'm not paying a whole lot of attention until the song Jacob just sang came on and I thought you got to be kidding me this was not just a cabinet meet there were, there were teams from all over and they're playing Christian songs we are so fortunate to live where we live um, so fortunate Surviving the holidays, a uh, grief share event coming up in two weeks, uh, two weeks from a day. Sunday, September, September, I'm backing up, okay. <laughs> Sunday, November the 13th at 3 o'clock. Even if you haven't taken part in the grief share, uh, any of the sessions, if you have lost a loved one, it's worth going through. Went through it uh, last year, it's phenomenal. So that's coming up in two weeks. And just want to thank everybody for their participation, their hard work in Trunk or Treat. Uh, to say it was a success last night would be an understatement. It was, and I want to stress this, by far the biggest we've ever had without question. And somebody approached me and said, a couple people, and said, are you counting? And I said, I, there's no way. There's no way to count. It was unreal, the people that came through our parking lot and our building last night. Uh, that's what it's about. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And today we're wrapping up this series on I am a church member. Uh, TJ started it off four weeks ago talking about the family. The family. And then uh, there's Reese. Reese, I was looking for you. I saw your family and I thought, good grief, they forgot him. I'm glad you're here. I see you now. Glad you're here, buddy. I'm glad you guys are here too. I'm so glad you are here. It's good to see you in the audience. What was I saying? Uh, I just have so much going on up here this morning, okay? Uh, so many things I want to tell you. Uh, yeah, TJ kicked off the series, then I, then I had a lesson, then Corey had a good lesson. Um, and then we're going to wrap up today. This is the first time we've ever done, the three of us have ever done a sermon series together. Hope you got some little something out of it. I appreciate your patience with it. You're not sure who's going to preach the next week. But it, it was really a neat thing, so I hope you, hope you liked it too. From the time we are small children, if you think about it, it's all about our preferences and desires. It's really all about us. We learn very early what we want, and that, that's my toy, that's, that's my doll, and I didn't play with dolls, I played with action figures, but that's, that's my toy. It's about, it's about my preference, it's about my desire, it's about what I want. On the playground we might hear things like, I'm first, or he's on my team, or this is the game I want us to play. Because it's about what I want. Parents work hard and teachers work hard to teach the kids, you got to share. But still we think it's about our preferences and our desires. Marketing plans from big firms have bought into this and, and they use slogans like, have it your way. It's your life. You only live once. So it's no wonder, even as adults, we have a genuine interest in our own preferences and desires. 
So it's really not shocking that even in the church, we're interested in our preferences and desires. I may have a different idea about what ministry is than your idea. My preferences, my desires may differ a little when it comes to ministry, when it comes to Bible class ideas. And what about the church committee meetings? And I prefer this color or I like this kind of decor or whatever. All of our preferences and desires come out. And we tend to believe that our preferences, our desires are really the way we should go. Right? And we say, you know, this is really silly. It's not about us. And I understand that. But here's the, here's the fact of the matter. People have left congregations because their preference and their desire was in their eyes ignored. In other words, they didn't get their way. So they went somewhere else thinking, I'll pick my toys up, I'll go down the road, and maybe they'll give me my way. Church is not about my preferences and desires. Church is not about your preferences and desires. we, we got to get that. It's just not about us and what we want and how we want it. Everything else in life seems to be, or at least we make it that way. But church is not about my preferences and desires, and I shouldn't let it be how. How? Well, we're going to start with this, this morning. We need to have the me last mentality. We need to have the me last mentality. You'd think we'd, we'd outgrow the me first mentality since we're adults, right? You'd think we'd overcome the me first mentality since we're Christians. But truth is, even Christian adults still want their preferences and desires. If you give me the opportunity in the meeting, if you ask my opinion, I'll tell you the best way to do it, right? Won't you? Because my way is going to be the best way because it's my preference, my desire. We want our way when it comes to worship style. We want our way when it comes to songs. We want our way when it comes to the song leader. We want our way in meetings in regards to different ministries. We want our way. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, you've got a congregation that I really believe good-hearted Christian people. But boy, they struggled. I mean, almost from one chapter to the next do we see another problem. And I mean right off, right off from the start, Paul addresses a major problem. The first three uh, chapters or so, he deals with division. And notice what he says in verse 10 and following, 1 Corinthians 1. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may have perfectly, or may be perfectly united in mind and thought. He says, I just want you to get along. I want you to get along. My brother, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Listen to the quarrels. Listen to the bickering. See if you can hear us in this. What I mean is this, verse 12. One of you says, well, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, and another, I follow Cephas, and still another, I follow Christ. And they would choose and pick, and they had in their mind their own preference and desire for their favorite speaker, their favorite preacher. And, and the intellectual said, well, Apollos is by far the, the more gifted speaker. I'll follow him. And some said, oh, I like Paul. I like the way he lays it out there. And others would say, I like Peter or Cephas. But the, it was all about their preferences and their desires. And that's what created the rift. That's what created the division. And there was much division in this congregation in Corinth. Because they got caught up in one regard, or one reason, is because they got caught up in wanting to do it their own way. Well, this guy's the better speaker. Well, this guy is. Well, I like him. 
When at the end of the day, it's not about what you want and what I want. Go back to Mark chapter 9. Look at Mark 9 real quick with me. The Corinthians argued over their favorite preacher. And Jesus has a a congregation, a conversation, let's try that, a conversation with his apostles. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 33 and following, it says, They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, Why were you arg- What were you arguing about on the road? They kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. They didn't want to tell him. I mean, he called them out. Hey, what was the argument about, guys? And they're silent. They don't want to go there. So sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and he said, If anyone wants to be first, listen, this is huge. If anyone wants to be first, everybody's ears perk up because that's where I want to be. I mean, when we're on the playground and they're choosing teams, I want to be chosen first. Don't you? When they're picking who's going to get to play, well, I want to play. I mean, when we're talking about who's going first, you have my attention. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and he said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last. He said, you got to be last. How many wake up? Or maybe I should say it this way. How many woke up this morning with the mindset, I'm going to be last at everything today. I want to be last at everything. When we go to the restaurant, I want to be last in line. I want to let everybody else get their table first. I want to be last. When we choose what we're going to watch on television this evening, I want to be last. You watch what you want to watch. We'll watch what you want to watch. You don't want to watch a football game? We'll watch a movie. Oh, please. No. But, (laughs) right? Right? I'm going to be last in everything. How many wake up with that mindset every day? Today, I'm going to be last. And see, if we did, man, the road rage would cut out. Think about it. When we're cutting people off and they're cutting us off, that's because we're in a hurry. i got to get there first. Right? And what if everybody just waited and said, no, 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 you go. I'm in no hurry. I'm going to be last today. You go. And we're holding doors for one another. We're not knocking people down trying to be the first into the elevator. We're going last. We're going to be last today in everything. And see, that's the complete opposite of what the world teaches and stands for The world says, it's about you. The world says, it's your life. The world says, you need to get everything you can get out of this life because it's true, you don't know if you're going to see tomorrow, so you better live it up today. And if you have to step on someone, if you have to cut someone off in traffic, if you have to push someone aside, you do it. And Jesus, in this pivotal teaching moment, would say to the core, the apostles, those that you and I would say, they are the spiritual elite. He says, guys, if you want to be first, let me let you in on a secret. You need to be the very last. You need to be last. I got to be honest with you, I don't wake up with that mindset every day. In golf, whoever has the best score on a hole goes, tees off first on the next hole. And I know that. I have golf etiquette. The thing is, when we get there, I'm ready to hit. And so sometimes I jump up and I hit before my partners do, and they had a better score probably every time. Me first. No, no, Jesus says, you got to be last. Church members, Christians, should have the humble, me last mentality. Look at a few passages with me. Go to James 4 real quickly. James chapter 4.
in verse 10. James 4 verse 10, James would say this, Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Humility, Jesus would say in Luke chapter 9, Luke 9 and verse 23. Luke 9 and verse 23, Jesus would say, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In this attitude of self-denial every day, what a process it is. But this attitude of daily self-denial is accepting the me last mentality. Not about me, I don't have to go first at everything or anything for that matter. You want to ensure... You want to make sure that you don't allow church to be about your preferences and desires. You need to have the me last mentality. Let's move on. Secondly, back in Mark chapter 9, the conversation. So Jesus, sitting down, verse 35, called the twelve to him and he said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last. The end of the line, man. And servant of all. So secondly, first of all, we've got to have the me last mentality. But secondly, we have to be a servant to all. Now let me share a few things. The word servant is found about 57 times in the New Testament. Sometimes it refers to the role of that person in the household, the servant of that family. But many times the word servant refers to the role we assume as Christians, and you say, well, I, I never signed up for that role. Oh, but you did. Remember when you were still wet? Remember when you were still wet? And you were raised with Christ out of the waters of baptism? You didn't know it then, maybe. But you signed up to be a servant. That's what we all are. If you want to bull it, that doesn't matter how much money you make or where you work or, or what accolades and achievements you have. You're a servant. You're a servant at the end of the day. So the word serve occurs some 58 times in the New Testament. It says to me, serving is important. Jesus says if you really want to be first, you've got to be the very last. But you also have to be a servant of all. Of all. I have no problem serving those that I know will serve me. You know what I'm saying? You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. But Jesus said, I want you to be a servant of all. That's right, Chuck. Even the people that aren't going to serve you, you better serve them. Even the people that might be rude to you, even the people that may not like you, I want you to serve them. Servant of all. Jesus wouldn't ask us to do something that he didn't do. In Matthew 20 and verse 28, he said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's look at one of these um, great stories in John. John 13. John 13. It was just before the Passover feast. I'm in verse 1. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, after he had poured water into a, b a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. A servant does the task that many believe are beneath him. A servant says, that's not beneath me because I, I'm a servant. Yeah, I'll wash the feet. One of the coolest stories, and TJ has shared with me when they go to um, TLC, and sometimes they will have the teens to wash one another's feet, and we're going, nasty, gross, pitiful, awful. But that's a beautiful picture of serving. 
And I mean, that's stripping it down raw. That's more than going and refilling someone's tea, isn't it? Or picking their trash up and taking it to the trash can. I mean, we're talking socks and shoes off, baby. Washing the feet. Man, that's serving. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Peter replied, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. You see, Peter even thought this task of the Messiah, the Lord washing feet, was beneath him. And Jesus is showing them what serving is all about. In verse 10, Jesus said, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you're clean, though not ever one of you. Speaking of Judas, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that, was, and that is why he said, Not ever one of you was clean. But when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, and he returned to this place, to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked him. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And his message is this, I want you to serve everybody. You really want to be first? Then you need to be last of all. You need to be very last and servant of all. Can you be a servant to all? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You say, well, but Jesus was so close to his disciples. It was probably not a big deal for him to wash their feet. Oh, I think it was a huge deal. So much so, Peter's thinking, you're, you're a little above this, Jesus. You can't wash my feet. But he also washes the feet of Judas Iscariot, already knowing that Judas would be the one to betray him. Remember I said a minute ago, I, can, I don't have a problem serving somebody if they serve me, right? I mean, that's nature. You do me a favor? Yeah, I'll do you a favor. That's no problem. But remember what he said in Mark 9. I want you to be a servant to all. No matter how they treat you, even the Judas Iscariot that stabs you in the back and betrays you, I want you to wash his feet too. Thinking of, of a guy that probably set one of the most beautiful examples of what a servant is. We had a guy in the congregation, this was many years ago, another place. And um, he, he just had some, some health issues and things. And he, I, I'm not going to get graphic, but I think I could say this much. He made a mess in the restroom one day and, and couldn't clean it up. And it was just a bad deal. And one of the guys, uh, one of the shepherds, I think he was a shepherd. I know he was at one time. I don't know if he was then. doesn't matter. But he silently went in there. And on his hands and knees, he cleans up after this guy. Now, I was the guy that went to him and said, man, you don't need to be doing that. That's nasty. You don't need to do that. And he said, well, who's going to do it? And I think about that. That's a servant. Because you're thinking what I'm thinking. Don't act like you're not. You're not thinking, Chuck, I can't believe you said that was nasty. You're thinking it's nasty. <laughs> but he went in there and cleaned it up. That's a servant to all. You see, a servant is not self-serving, but he serves others selflessly. And church members, uh, as church members, we give up preferences, we give up our preferences and desires to be servants. So I don't want to... I want, I don't want church to be about my preferences and desires, so I've got to have the me last mentality. I've got to be a servant to all. And finally, lastly, go to Philippians chapter 2 with me. I've got to have the attitude of Jesus every single day. The prayer, part of that prayer is, Lord, help me to have the attitude of Jesus. Help me to have his attitude when I'm dealing with other people when I'm trying to serve other people. Just help me to have his attitude. And everything I do, help me to have his attitude. And this is so biblical. In Philippians 2, 5, Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And we're going, oh man, really? That's got to be difficult. Well, he describes exactly what he expects. 
who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So let's describe Jesus' attitude. Did not consider equality with God humility. Complete humility. Emptied himself of deity, came to earth to be a physical man so that he could understand what you and I deal with and, and go through. And he could die on the cross, took on the form of a servant. Humility humbled himself, became obedient. Humility. To have the attitude of Jesus is to be a humble servant. To have the attitude of Jesus is to be obedient. To have the attitude of Jesus is to put other people before yourself. Back up to Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Man, he showed us what humility is. In humility. Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. And if you have the me last mentality, and if you have this attitude that I'm going to be a servant to all, and you're striving to have the attitude of Jesus every day, you're not going to have a problem putting others before you, no matter how they treat you. You'll just put them before you. Because you realize your role is that of a servant. And if we'll do that, church will not be about our preferences and desires. In Missouri, I got a call one Wednesday from a frantic mother who said, my teenage daughter just ran away. Members of our congregation. I said, really, do we have any idea where she is? She said, no, she didn't come home. This, this just, she was just a basket case, as you can imagine. They come home last night, I have no idea, got the police on the situation. So I get with the, the elders and I said, guys, I don't think we can do Bible class just as is, act like nothing's happened. Man, let's have some kind of prayer thing tonight and pray for this young lady. Because this was early in the day, by the time Bible class time rolls around, she's still, no one's heard from her. We don't know where this teenage girl is, if, what's going on. Scary, scary deal. So we have a... Um, Put together a little prayer service, and we, we prayed for her and her mother, and as you would. And then at the end, this gentleman stands up and he says, I need to see the elders and the deacons in, in Chuck's office, and Chuck there too. And we, we had finished up, and I thought, boy, I don't know what's going on here. So we go back in my office, and he begins to give out orders of how we're going to handle this. He said, we need to make flyers, and we need to post these flyers all over town, and I need you people to go here and here and dividing us up. And I, st I said, whoa, whoa, stop. I said, I just got off the phone before we started this prayer service with the girl's mother. She's not here tonight because she's home, what, as the police told her to be, and wait at home, don't go anywhere, stay by that phone. And I said, the mother said to me, don't you do anything. Because the police have an idea where she is. Just don't interfere. Just pray. And I said, so man, we gotta, we've got to, we got to go along with that. He storms out. He's so angry. We go on with our night. And, and I, I call him later. And I said, listen, this is later in the evening. I said, I, I wasn't trying to offend you. But I said, man, we've got to do what the authorities are wanting us to do and what this mother's wanting us to do. And he was completely belligerent. Because we didn't do what he wanted to do. It's not about your preferences. It's not about your desires. Nothing wrong with your idea, but we were instructed not to do that. And it's not about you. If we could just get that simple lesson through our mind. It's not about my preferences and my desires. Aren't we trying to teach that to our children? You know, the quickest way we can teach our kids is to get it ourselves. The church, I will not let church be about my preferences and desires. Today, if we can help you in a physical way or a spiritual way, if we can serve you any way possible, 
Maybe you need to be baptized to have your sins washed away. Whatever your need might be, we'll have an elder here to greet you, waiting on you as we stand and as we sing together.